I'm surprised it got this much attention for a Tuesday afternoon. We are too. Uh, so I'm Chris Walls. I'm the property manager for our Mid and Upper Cape Sanctuaries for Mass Audubon. I'm sure you've probably heard about Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary out in Wellfleet, but there's several other sanctuaries within a more reasonable drive and less traffic uh, that you can help that can find right through our Mass Audubon website. So I oversee four sanctuaries open to the public: as Long Pasture, which is in Barnstable. A Schumet Holly, which is in East Falmouth, over behind the Barnstable Fairgrounds. A Skunknet River, which is in Osterville. And the Barnstable Great Marsh Sanctuary, which is in Barnstable. Uh, I also oversee another 9 to 12 properties that aren't open to the public, uh, from Dennis all the way down to Cuddyhunk. Uh, so you can check it out by going to massaudubon.org. And right here, you can go to a sanctuary that you already know the name of, or you can click Find a Place. And now the Wi-Fi switch. And when that opens up, it'll show a map, and you can zoom into your range. And there it Come on now. Uh, so I do everything you would do for your own homes. I, I do maintain the trails. I'm the landscaper. I'm the mechanic, the carpenter, the painter, and. <laughs> Um, but I have degrees in environmental science and biology with an interest in birds, so I get to do programs like kayak trips, uh, bird lectures, and, uh, and other programming. And here is one here. Um, I'll go to that later then. Uh, and I'll start right from here. Uh, so when it comes to winter birds, uh, it's not just birds that are here only for the winter, it's birds that are here year round. Um, and there are many of them. Uh, how do they survive the winter? Well, a, uh, one of the things that you can do to help uh, birds is provide food, shelter, and water. And one of the things that they use to survive the winter is shelter. So by having lots of natural cover, like shrubs and, and evergreens uh, that hold their, the needles through the winter, because if it loses leaves, then it's not a good spot to hide and get out of the wind. Uh, they also fluff up their feathers, that traps air, uh, and that's why we have lots of coats and down feathers uh, from ducks, uh, because they are very warm, uh, though most jackets now are synthetic or uh, goose and duck feathers from uh, hunting. <coughs> Some species that like to come to Cape Cod here for the winter, they usually arrive in late October and through November, and will stay as long as there's open water. Uh, once the water starts to freeze, and some of these freshwater uh, species of ducks will move on. And, uh, it's what they call short distance migrants. So instead of flying from here all the way to South America for the winter, they fly just far enough that they can find open water or food or their uh, preferred habitat. So when it comes to the ducks, you can watch them and uh, you watch for different features when come to identifying them. Um, what I always carry when I'm out in the field is you know, a pair of binoculars, which uh, if you look at your own or if you have them or are looking to buy some, uh, there are numbers that on the dial that tell you what the magnification level is. That's the first number. So these are 8 by 42s. Uh, you can buy 7 by 50s or 10 by 40s or and what that is, is just the magnification. So you can have a small pair like opera glasses that magnify 10 times, but they're very small because the, the millimeters in the lens, the size of how much light lets in, determines how far you can see. So when you see photographers with their lens on their cameras or spotting scopes or telescopes, that big lens on the front and the length determines the focal point and how far into the distance you can see. Some other things I always have, a notebook to write down your sightings, uh, a waterproof case of some sort for cleaning rags to keep the lenses clean on your binoculars, and a field guide, which can be Peterson Field Guide to Eastern Birds, North America Birds, it can be Birds of Cape Cod, it can be Birds of Massachusetts. If you're just beginning, I'd suggest starting with a local field guide because you can look it into this book, which is for North American birds, and see something that should be in California, and it looks similar to something that can be here. Not that it wouldn't turn up here, but 
it's unlikely. So when it comes to ducks and the field guide, you look for where is the white. And see where is the white on these two birds. And it's on the belly and on the rump. And uh, it's easier to see on a dabbling duck, meaning the, like our mallards, which tip over head first. Same with some of our geese. They end to reach stuff and food uh, substrate at the bottom. And then you get our diving ducks, so like mergansers and loons uh, and, and eiders, which dive under the water completely looking for food. One of our most common and abundant uh, is the American black duck. It does compete with the, the mallard, which was brought over for hunting. Uh, they are common. They can do fresh or salt water. Uh, they'll eat mostly vegetation, but they'll also eat invertebrates like insects and uh, small amphibians and frogs. And, and one way to tell them, uh, in, especially in flight, when identifying them, is you can see the underwing, which is kind of gray and silvery. So when they fly by, you can see that in flight, though they do look very similar to female mallards. Uh, another duck that comes here, uh, back in October, there were about 5,000 to 10,000 of these ducks in Barnstable Harbor and in Cape Cod Bay. Uh, they come here for the winter to Nantucket Sound, uh, along with a few other species. And this is the common eider. And they dive under the water completely and will eat shellfish and crabs. Uh, they actually eat this, uh, the blue mussels that you find out in the bays. And they'll swallow those whole and digest them inside their gizzard. Uh, another duck, which is uh, really popular, is the long-tailed duck. Uh, that male there in the top, the drake, with the long tail and the pink on his bill, looks white in the winter to blend in with the snow in the, in the surrounding habitat. In the summer, it looks dark. It, it molts and changes all its feathers so that its neck is dark. Uh, the female is down below. Uh, and the male will look more like the female comes in the summer. Because you don't want to stick out and look bright white in the summer. Uh, then you're prone to predation. Uh, one of the biggest predators would be peregrine falcons. Um, peregrine falcons can eat over 300 species of birds. They've been known to hunt that many species. And we can see just about 300 species in Massachusetts throughout the year. So just about every bird you can see out there on the beaches and in the air and on the trees can be eaten by a peregrine falcon, or has been. Uh, this is the most abundant, common, and smallest diving duck that we have here in the Cape. They come here just for the winter. They like fresh and salt water. They're kind of a mix between a dabbling duck and a diving duck. It tries to be a diving duck, uh, but it, it does dabble a lot. You can find them in fresh and salt water and, and um, marsh or uh, uh, brackish waters. And you can see by the amount of white on this bird, uh, it's very easy to identify with that large white patch on the back of its head. Uh, in the right lighting, you can see iridescent blues, greens, and purples on its head. And uh, it is very neat. Uh, a lot of these birds, uh, they can dive for several minutes at a time. Uh, again, looking for various food items. One of the this is probably one of the better known birds. Uh, most people think of Maine or uh, Minnesota when thinking of common loons. But they actually come here in the winter in large numbers and uh, stay in, and prefer salt water in the winter. In the summer, they prefer fresh water. Their legs are so far back on their bodies that they can't walk on land. So when they make a nest, they actually make it on, on floating vegetation out in the lakes, and it can blow around the lake if it's not attached to something. And that's why the young duck, uh, loon, uh, young, you can see on, on its back there, they, when they don't swim, they climb up onto the adult's back. <clears throat> now in the winter, uh, kind of like with the, uh, the great white shark, you know, how it, it's white below and gray above, so it blends in with the water. And it's hard to see from above because you're looking down at dark, and when you're looking up, it blends into the sky. So loons, even though they're all black in the summer, 
come winter, they actually mold and are more gray and white. So everything that's black on that loon right there will be gray come winter. And what you want to look at when identifying them is that dagger-like beak on the front. Very large, pronounced, long, and pointed. And they, uh, they uh, forage and catch fish while swimming through the water. Um, and most of you probably recognize this. This is a hooded merganser. And they nest up in the wooded areas and around lakes and ponds in Canada. They move through here in the spring and point south and staying through the winter. Um, they have a specialized bill, which is long and thin, for catching fish. Now, they don't have teeth, but what they do have is a serrated edge. So it makes it easier for them to grab fish while, while swimming underwater. So the male has that bright white patch on the back of its head. All those feathers are, are controlled by the, by the muscles in the bird's head. So it can raise those feathers and create that large rounded shape or it can drop them and it'll look uh, more like it's combed back. They nest in tree cavities. So the size of the cavity depends, determines what size the bird can use it. So when you have chickadees, and smaller woodpeckers, they want to, they, woodpeckers make their own cavity, and if it's a small entrance hole, then only a chickadee can get in. But if it's a big entrance hole, like a pileated woodpecker, then larger birds can get into that cavity, uh, like barred owls, wood ducks, hooded mergansers, common mergansers, and other duck species that nest in secondary cavities. Because woodpeckers don't reuse the same hole from year to year, they make new ones. All right, moving on to some of the owls. So most birds have the same anatomy as far as feathers uh, and beaks and tails. Not all of them have talons uh, or sharp beaks. But they all have primary or flight feathers. And those are like the fingers extending out at the wing. And your secondary feathers and tail feathers. Those are all flight feathers. Uh, that's why parrots and parakeets, if you were to clip those flight feathers, then they're flightless, uh, and they can only go short distances. So if they were to have any type of injury that broke some feathers or get caught, like in uh, glue traps for mice, you know, you're putting those out to catch rodents, but sometimes screech owls will try to go catch the rodents that are sitting on it struggling, and then they get stuck and caught. Uh, so if, if anything, snap traps are probably the way to go. Uh, especially, you don't want to use rodenticides. Uh, but with owls, they have that facial disc on the front, uh, which helps them uh, direct sound to their ears. And we know that uh, owls uh, have adapted methods for hunting in the dark. So they have a facial disc, like on the barn owl there, it's a, either a sliced apple or a heart shape. And what that does is it directs sounds to their ears. Their ears are on both sides of the head, but one is higher than the other, and one is four, four more forward on the head than the other. So within fractions of a second, they are able to determine where a sound came from. Uh, and mathematically, it just takes practice. We wouldn't be able to figure out how to do it uh, without using math. And for them, it's just practice. Uh, other adaptations is camouflage. You can see the screech owl that's there on the right. Uh, during the day, when the owls are roosting, because they're more susceptible to being seen by crows uh, and larger predators, they hide. And they'll sit up against the trunk of a tree, and they'll blend right in. It also helps to hide them from their prey items. So this screech owl, if it's not sitting in its cavity during the day, it'll be perched up against a tree like that and they'll just hang out. But if you were to ever hear crows making lots and lots and lots of noise and swooping and dive bombing, it's called mobbing. And it's usually because they're after a red-tailed hawk or a great horned owl or something that's in the area. Now, one other adaptation besides their eyesight uh, is their feathers. So you see that fringe on the end? Uh, it helps to break up the air moving over the feather. So if you ever heard a moose, a, a, a mute swan, uh, or a goose take off from flight, 
they're very loud. You can hear the wind hitting their wings and the feathers. They make a lot of noise. So their feathers are designed so that the wind bounces, kind of curves off of the feather and doesn't make that type of noise. And that's also why they have feathers down to their toes. And their eyes, so they are, they rely on sound a lot, but they also have very good eyesight for seeing in the dark. So they have a lot more rods than, than we do. So they're able to draw in a lot more light. And they don't see colors like we do, they can see black and white, which makes it much easier to see in the dark. Uh, but it's also uh, a myth, is they cannot turn their heads all the way around 360 degrees. It's more like 270, so they can go almost all the way around. And the reason they can do that is they have more vertebrae in their neck. So their necks are longer, and they're able to spin just a bit farther around with each vertebra. And that's because, and they can't, like us, we, they can't look off to the left or the right with their eyes. Their eyes are fixed inside their head because there's a bone inside their eye. And it means they can't turn it, so they have to turn their entire head to see what's going on behind them. And right now, great horned owls are preparing to lay eggs. They are the first bird to start nesting in Massachusetts every year. Uh, and right about now, it's always around Super Bowl Sunday when that happens, uh, I start to hear more great horned owls in my neighborhood, uh, which means that they're hunting, they're trying to find prey to feed the female who's sitting on the nest incubating all the eggs. Uh, once the eggs hatch, which is usually around our first thaw, uh, historically our first thaw was in March, now it's in December, <laughs> but we don't get quite the winters we used to anymore. But they will sit right up against the trunk of the tree like that to stay warm. Uh, I actually, I heard one this morning. Right around 6, 6.30, they'll be active uh, and calling. And then again, about that same time as it starts to get dark in the evening. And then on clear, calm, windless nights is when you're going to have your best chance at seeing or hearing one. You just got to get out at those times of the day. Now there, wait a minute. <laughs> Who edited this slide? <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, that is not the great horned owl. That is a snowy owl. In recent years, with the eruption we had in 2014, I think it was, where they were just everywhere. It was in every newspaper. We were getting 100 calls a day asking where to see them. Uh, they do come down. There are some around. Uh, the most recent sightings that I remember or recall were uh, early January on Nantucket. So if you could get out there and have a full day to get out there and look for it, you could see them. But typically, uh, they show up in the winter. They like our dunes and beaches because it's very much like the Arctic tundra, which is above the tree line. So they don't normally perch in trees. Uh, they, what they do is they'll perch on high hills uh, to scope the land around them when looking for predators or for food. Now, they are our heaviest owl. And they can take down a Canada goose if they wanted to. And a very large bird, and very large talons, and the males are much more white than the females. The females will show a lot of black barring, like on the breast there and in the wings, because she needs to blend in with the ground in the, in the summer. So in the Arctic in the summer, there's no snow. Maybe on some of the higher ranges nearby there were, but it's mostly grasses and marsh and a lot of shorebirds. So a lot of these owls will hunt birds, uh, other birds by the wing and catch them in flight, uh, but they'll also catch lemmings and rodents. And when the food is abundant, then all the eggs they lay will survive and hatch, and, and then we end up with a lot more owls getting pushed farther south. So this year it hasn't been too bad. Uh, in the way of food, so they, ha they haven't needed to push as far south as they had in previous years. But it's about every six to eight years we get an eruption where we see more owls than, than usual. All right, now I get into more of the, the common birds that are here year round that you're more likely to see or notice. And then we get uh, American crow. Uh, I'm sure you might have seen the BBC documentaries that mention how smart they are and how they can recognize faces. So if you were to injure one of them, then the, the others would recognize you and then mob you and chase you. Uh, but typical behaviors for them is to mob predators uh, like red-tailed hawks because they compete for food. 
a red-tailed hawk can sit at the top of a tree or be a half mile away and see a food item that a crow needs to be only 10 feet from the sea. And that's why you see crows walking through fields. They're looking for mice and voles and grasshoppers and other things they, they can eat. But if there's a hawk nearby, that hawk is going to see it before them and get that food item. So it's an advantage to the crow to chase them away. And that's why you'll see several crows mobbing and making noise and chasing the hawk away. Uh, another behavior you'll see when they're feeding is they work in groups and uh, kind of leapfrog. A group will fly in, one will land in a tree, the next one will go farther, land in another tree, and then so on. And they'll just they'll work together like that. And then they use their cause or call to alert the others um, if there's food or a predator nearby. And our red-tailed hawk. So our resident, it's our largest hawk. It's our most common hawk. Uh, it is not an eagle. It is not an osprey. I'll show you the differences. So with the red-tailed hawks, uh, you can see the short wedge-shaped tail. Uh, when they're an adult, you can see the red shine through it from, uh, or on the back side. And they have a belly band, which you can see right across the belly. And uh, those, I got a glare on my screen here. So right up near the leading edge of the wing, they've got those black marks. So those, those are some ways to tell it's a red-tailed hawk. And they're soaring hawk. So they've got the long, broad, broad wings uh, for circling. And a lot of times you'll see them in pairs. So if you go driving down the highway and you see one sitting in a tree, there's probably another one within a mile or so because the, they're year-round, and they stay bond bonded throughout the winter. And because great horned owls don't build nests, a great horned owl will take over a red-tailed hawk nest. And because they nest in February, they get first pick. So each year, a red-tailed hawk may need to build a new nest because it, you know, it's been claimed by a great horned owl. And another neat fact is red-tailed hawks, most of the time they will pick their food items apart and then eat them. Uh, if they're small enough, they swallow them whole, and they can digest more of the bones. So in the owl pellets, when you break those open and look at them, you can find bones and jaws and skulls and parts of whatever they've eaten. Whereas red-tailed hawk pellets, there's hardly anything in them. It's just hair or feathers. Okay. Now, if you keep uh, feeders out, this is one of our more common uh, attendants. It's a downy woodpecker, and uh, not most of our woodpeckers are black and white. Most all of them, the males especially, have red on the back of the head. So that's really not a good description of a woodpecker when you're asking somebody which woodpecker do they see. Uh, this, so the one in this photo is a male downy woodpecker. Uh, there's a very similar hairy woodpecker, which is a little bit larger, and it has a longer bill. So when you see the two together, it's very obvious. But if you're looking at this, see how small that bill is compared to the size of the head? It's very small. With a hairy woodpecker, the bill is as long as the head is large. So you go by that one feature, and it's pretty easy to tell the difference. And uh, I'll go into comparison photos later on if the internet starts coming to work again. Uh, here's our morning dove. Uh, you hear this call a lot. A lot of people might think it's an owl because you don't know where the call's coming from. Uh, but, but they do make some calls similar. It doesn't. It's not a loud and hoot. It's more of a hoo. And uh, they will pick up lots of small stone and grit off the ground, which is why you see them on roadsides. And that goes into their gizzard and their crop, and it helps to break down the food items that they eat. Because if they're, they're eating hard seeds, uh, they don't have acid in their stomachs like we do. So they need uh, grit to help break down food items. And that's why uh, owls and chickadees and gulls will, and other birds will regurgitate a pellet. They regurgitate the non-digestible food items like uh, insect carapaces and shells and things like that, and uh, fish gills come back out. And our state bird, which may not be in Massachusetts in the future. Uh, with global warming and temperature changes and climate change, uh, there are some maps that show that birds that were here 
uh, historically have started to move farther north and birds like the Carolina Wren and the Northern Cardinal, which were farther south 50, 60 years ago, are moving north farther than they ever have. So maybe uh, the Carolina chickadee will turn up in Massachusetts more regularly before we know it. But chickadees uh, are very common, very vocal, and a lot of bird species rely on chickadees to let them know that predators are around. So if you can entice a chickadee to react to yourself by pishing, they call it, pretending to, to mock an alarm call, uh, or if you were paying attention and just when you're out walking your dog, uh, they react and they start saying chickadee dee 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 dee, and the number of d's indicates the threat level of the predator. So if it's a ground predator like a cat or a weasel, it's different than if there's an avian predator nearby. And if you start to listen for alarm calls from chickadees and titmice and other birds, then you get about a three, three to four second delay before the predator comes flying in. And it's really neat to, uh, to see those behaviors. And uh, chickadees are, because they have a smaller bill, uh, they can't just, and smaller bodies, they can't just eat seeds whole. So they have to crack open the shell, take the seed out. A lot of times they'll also store uh, seeds and hide them in places up in the bark on tree and trees for uh, food late, uh, later on. Uh, yep, and tufted titmouse, uh, it's related to chickadees. Sounds a lot like a chickadee a lot of times. A little bit larger. And as you watch these birds at your feeder, you'll notice that there's, there is a pecking order. Legitimately, they, uh, the larger birds get to come in first and chase the other ones away. And then there's a hierarchy within the, all the tufted titmice that come. So there's a, uh, there's a boss titmouse that will get his pick first before the others. Same with the chickadees. And then you'll get something bigger come in like a blue jay and everything will flush away from the feeder. And they'll get, they'll get their fill and then some, some, uh, the young, smaller birds will come in. And American goldfinch, which right now isn't bright yellow. Uh, they will start molting soon. Right now they're more of an olive green. And you can recognize them by their flight call. That sounds like they're saying potato chip. So as, and they have an undulating flight. So as they go up and down, they make calls. So it's potato chip, potato chip, potato chip. And that's one way to tell that they're coming in flight when you hear them. Uh, and they like to eat uh, thistle or niger seed, uh, though they prefer sunflower if it's already has the shell taken off of it. And they'll use plant materials for their nest, and they nest later in the season. So they nest in July and August. And they will use uh, thistle. So if you have bull thistle in your yard or nearby, you can, you can spread the seeds for that, and you'll get more plants, and they can use that native plant uh, for materials for their nests and for feeding. I've even seen them glean um, fiber, uh, plant fibers caught in the window screen. They'll land right on the screen and start picking uh, plant fibers from it. So this is similar to a woodpecker and if you see it climbing on branches upside down head first like that then it's a nuthatch. And we have a white-breasted nuthatch and we have red-breasted nuthatches. And there are differences between male, the males and females, and it's how much black is in the crown on their head. But they nest uh, in cavities in trees. They cannot make their own cavity, so they have to find one. Uh, so there's got to be a lot of woodpeckers out there for all these chickadees, titmice, and nuthatches, and other birds that rely on nat ca natural cavities uh, for their nesting. Same with tree swallows and bluebirds. But they'll also use man-made nest boxes if you put them up on trees or on posts out in fields. All right, so um, when trying to identify a bird, you think to yourself certain aspects. Um, general, it's called uh, GIS, G-I-S-S, -S, general impression, shape, and size. So most people know the size of a robin or a crow uh, or the size of a chickadee. So, when describing the size of a bird, you say it was smaller than a chickadee or bigger than a chickadee. And this one right here is smaller than a chickadee, if you can imagine that. This is only about three and a half inches, which a chickadee is a little bit larger than that. These guys like to stay up in the crowns of pitch pines and, and other pine trees. 
Uh, they're more abundant in fall and through the winter here in the Cape. And they're very hard to, to find uh, because they're so small and they stay really high up. But you can hear them in a lot of different places. And there's also a, a ruby-crowned kinglet, which is really similar, that also comes through this area, especially in migration. All right, so now we get into these birds. Like, how do they survive the winter? What are they eating besides seed? Well, they're, they're eating left-behind berries from the shrubs uh, after they drop their leaves, uh, like winterberry and privet and honeysuckle and, and some of these other plants that are actually non-native invasives. But they find a food source if it's available, and if they can survive, then they'll eat it. So here's our eastern bluebird. It's a true red, white, and blue bird. Uh, it nests in cavities and in, in man-made boxes. Um, there are a lot of bluebird trails out in different properties where you can uh, find them. Uh, right now, this time of year, they're starting to look for cavities to nest in. So I find them there. They're going in and out of my nest boxes at the different sanctuaries I, I run. And they, uh, they're, they're trying it out. The, the female will fly in, she'll poke her head out, she'll poke it back in. And the male will fly up and stand at the entrance hole and put his head in and pull it back out because it's basically dry fitting or test fitting the house because the, the female will be inside sitting on the eggs and reaching up to take food from the male and then the male will be sitting on the entrance and giving her insects to feed the young. And then once the chicks have hatched and they're old enough, then she'll be able to leave the nest and they'll both be able to forage and come back and feed the young. And uh, if anyone's interested in nest box monitoring, uh, I have several, several, let's pray, actually probably closer to 50 nest boxes between our sanctuaries where we do want to do some monitoring and entering of data uh, and knowing how many chicks fledge and when and if they were successful or not. Uh, but they, there's probably, they, they'll nest in, or group, be it in groups in the winter, and you find, find as many as 12 uh, or more at times. So everybody mentions, uh, oh, I've got winter robins, or are they Canada robins, or Canadian robins? Canadians are people. Uh, Canada robins are just from Canada. Um, as with any individual, it comes down to preference. Uh, some of them will decide to move farther south than others. Uh, some will stay right here all winter. So uh, some of the robins we could have here in the summer are here in the winter, as well as some robins from Canada that have moved south because there's too much uh, snow cover so that, and frozen ground, so they can't get worms. Uh, so they have to eat berries. And when the berries get all eaten up, then they have to move to another area. Uh, so that's the short distance migra migration to find food. And, uh, you know, uh, what, so three weeks ago, they were picking insects and worms from the ground uh, here on the Cape. Uh, so plenty of food for them here. Sometimes they get in very large flocks of 100,000 or 200,000 birds. Uh, typically, you'll see them moving constantly in one direction for a day. So you could, if you watch sit in one spot, then robins just keep moving and moving and moving, all going uh, in the morning and throughout the day. And then come dusk, they'll all start to fly back in large numbers, uh, where you can easily see tens of thousands going to their, their evening roost. Yeah, this, uh, these are some birds that typically will find with American robins, especially in flight as they're heading into roost for the evening is uh, cedar waxwings. And there are well-known stories and even videos of drunk waxwings uh, because what happens is the berries will sit on the bushes and when food is scarce and they're trying to find them all, the berries are fermented. And if they eat too many, then they get drunk. And they aren't the only ones. Uh, it actually happens to a few different species of birds. And I've seen it happen to squirrels, too. They'll just eat too many apples that have been fermenting and sitting for the win through the fall and the winter. And then they have trouble climbing trees and, and flying from branch to branch. Uh, some other behaviors that cedar waxwings have been known to exhibit is they'll, when they're eating through all the berries in the tree, 
or the shrub, the, the one will sit at the end and actually they'll hit, pass berries down to each other from, from the end of the branches to the rest of the group rather than flying off so that they can each take their turn. All right, uh, yellow rumped warblers. Now you'd, you'd think that most warblers uh, have gone south for the winter, uh, way south, uh, usually the Gulf Coast and even down into South America. Uh, but the yellow rumped warblers actually come here for the winter. It's hard to find them in the summer. Uh, they like to, the higher elevation. And when you're at sea level, higher elevation doesn't work down here unless you're uh, in what's the highest point in uh, Falmouth. It's pretty close, isn't it? Um, so they will nest in forests and like pitch pine areas. So this time of year is where you're going to find them. Uh, and you just sometimes called butter butts uh, because they have a yellow rump above the base of their tail. So when they're moving around or flying away, that's what you can see, and it's easy to identify that. All right, and then our our northern cardinal, which is uh, I've had as many as twelve all around the feeders at once. Uh, some people, depending on where they are, they have thirty, forty, fifty cardinals all hanging out around the feeders. Uh, at that point it gets very hard to get a good count of numbers because they're just blurring together. There's just red spot after red spot. And then they move. Uh, some people have seen where uh, it happens in both blue jays, cardinals, and some other birds. They sometimes molt all the feathers in one area at one time. Uh, so there are plenty of pictures of cardinals and blue, blue jays without feathers on their heads. And it's n not typically from mites or from disease or anything. It's just it just randomly molted a bunch of feathers at once. Most birds will lose a, f a flight feather or two here and there uh, so that they can still fly uh, even though they're molting. Uh, ducks will actually go through a flightless period where they molt all their feathers uh, pre-migration. Uh, pre that way they have nice good feathers for flight. Uh, but because they can get their food from the water and they can get cover and protection, they're able to survive a flightless period. Whereas other birds, they wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, so if you see a cardinal or blue jay without feathers on its head, it's, it's fine. Uh, but revel in that, that view because you don't see it very often and they do look really prehistoric. Uh, but the male cardinals, so uh, a lot of birds uh, the colors are impregnated in the feathers. So a r cardinal, uh, it, when it, if it loses a feather, that feather is red through and through. Uh, whereas a blue jay, if it loses a feather and you were to pick it up and look at it at the blue side uh, and hold it up to the light, that blue disappears and it turns black because that blue color is reflective. So it reacts to the light reflecting off the feather to show you the blue color. So if blue jays could fly around upside down, they would all look black. And that's a neat little fact. So if you ever, and they molt feathers all the time, so you can pick it up, you just can't keep it. All right, here's a true winter bird for us here. Uh, it's, they don't survive on the Cape in the summer because they really like that high elevation. Um, and it does look like they're moving to points north to keep the elevation and temperature range that they like. Uh, but they like pine trees and coniferous forests. They are a sparrow, and they're related to sparrows, but they're not, they're not the typical LBJs or little brown jobbers uh, that are sparrows. So, but uh, the slate-colored or dark-eyed junco, they have the, great, the gray slate back with the pink bill. And they will normally forage for seed off the ground around your feeders. And uh, the field mark, when you see them, when they fly away, they have two white outer tail feathers. And that, that, you see that flick of white. So uh, another feature when identifying birds is, is it a flash of white? A flash of white is white in the wings. A flick of white would be white in the tails. Uh, and then you can get other features that you'd see it might be red in the back or the northern flicker's white rump. All right, so then we get into the big dilemma, is it a house finch or is it a purple finch? 
Uh, house finches and purple finches are really closely related. They're very similar. Uh, house finches look, are, are a slimmer version of the purple finch. So purple finches look more chunky, whereas house finches are more slim and slender. Uh, if you get into more specifics, it's the shape of the culmin or the top of the beak. So it drops farther and some of it's smoother on the other species. Uh, but what I look for when I'm looking at house finches and purple finches is uh, a house finch will have streaks on its flanks under the wings and the purple finch will have red colors without streaks. So they say that a purple finch is, uh, looks like a house finch dipped in raspberry jam. So if you were to take it and just dump it in, um, it looks more pink or purplish throughout the body uh, without streaking. And if you can recognize their calls, that's one way to really identify them pretty easily. Pine siskins are similar to house, or, uh, to have they're finches in general, but they're similar to gold finches in the way that they fly and the, their size. Uh, but they've got mostly brown streaking, like the house finch, and then they have the yellow and black and white markings in the wing that look like a goldfinch. And they sound very similar to a goldfinch in flight. Uh, they, if you get really accustomed to hearing what the goldfinch sounds like, then you'll notice the difference in a, when a pine siskin is around. So, uh, there's a reason they use canaries in the coal mine. Uh, birds typically react to uh, external uh, fluctuations in the environment. And uh, I don't know where this stat came from, it's a little older, but I'm sure everybody saw the most recent stat going through the news with the four and a half billion birds lost in the last uh, 50 years, uh, both to uh, loss of habitat uh, temperature climate shifts where they can't get the food they're looking for, um, the number of skyscrapers going up with windows. Uh, we lose an alarming number of birds to window strikes and to crashes with buildings during migration. And there are websites like FLAP, the Flight Awareness uh, Program, uh, that helps to let get cities like Toronto and other cities to shut off lights to skyscrapers so that they don't fly into those windows. Uh, as they say that they use the light, which, um, let's see, what was it, the, uh, the new uh, memorial down in New York City where they shine the lights up into the skies. And what happens is they have to shut those off periodically because birds are getting attracted to the light and they're flying around in circles in that beam of light that's extending so high up into the sky. So they actually shut that off for a period of time to let the birds fly through and then they turn them back on. Uh, so this is a, gives you a visual representation of what's happening. Um, some species uh, that they, like the wild turkey, uh, if you follow the dot there, shows that it, it's moved its range north 400 miles from where it was normally seen. Um, some other species like the house finch went from, it's a west coast bird that was brought to the east coast and uh, has flourished here but it moved its range naturally uh, to the east and then you get some other species there like the purple finch and ring-billed gull which has moved slowly north and is now, this map is a little out of date. Uh, but you can see ranges change over the years and that, all that is also visually represented by eBird and how citizen scientists or birders report their sightings. So there are some trends where birds like the junco are moving farther north and may disappear from Massachusetts or uh, the summer tanager spending more time in, the, in the, uh, New England in the summer. Uh, we're already seeing it with birds like painted buntings uh, that have been seen lately and western tanagers and, and other birds that should be in warmer climates this time of year. Uh, but they're able to survive these more mild uh, winters, especially here in the Cape, uh, that not something you would normally find out in Berkshire County or in Worcester. It's because we have a more mild winter because of the ocean effect. Uh, but we are seeing more southern birds turning up in places where they never have before. 
Okay, so now I will exit out of this and try the internet again. Yeah, there we go. So you can zoom right in. And there's Wellfleet way out there. And look at that, there's five sanctuaries right in the area. So we got a Schumit Holly, it's right there near a Schumit, Schumit Pond. Uh, got Samson's Island in Katuit Bay, Skunknet River in Osterville, it's on Bumps River Road, and Barnstable Great Marsh Sanctuary on 6A, and then Long Pasture, which is uh, on uh, Bone Hill Road in Cumaquid. We have a visitor center there and uh, year-round staff uh, with two and a half miles of trails. Right now we're working on putting in a new building uh, so that we can provide uh, better school programming and more public pro programming for groups this size because right now we're in Sherman Parker's old house and we can only fit about 30 people in each in a specific room that we do our lectures in. Uh, so you can find any other sanctuary in the state through our website massaudubon.org. We have over 40 in, throughout the state. Mem Mass Audubon membership gets you in, into each one. Uh, without paying a fee, but otherwise, if you don't have one, it's only like three or four dollars. So, uh, for a sanctuary with a visitor center, and it, someday maybe we'll have an actual sanctuary out on Cuddy Hunk. Uh, but we do trips to there. So off on the side desk panel, we've got some flyers for programs, a sign-in sheet for emails if you want to get our mailing, be on our mailing list. Uh, we also do some other great programming. So I'm going to show you a couple resources here online before I go into some questions. You can go to allaboutbirds.org and it's run by Cornell University in the, in the lab and uh, it's like an online field guide. Uh, and if you know the bird you're looking for you can type it right in. Right? So if we type in uh, and then it brings up suggestions. And just like a field guide, it'll give you a description, show you photos, but the difference with this is you can listen. And you can watch videos, which you can't get from a book. Field guides are exactly that. They're field guides. You have them out with you while you're out in the field. And so American Golden Plover, it's a shorebird. And it nests up in the tundra in the Arctic. It likes to migrate through farms and fields in the, in the winter. Uh, it's rare for us to see them in the, in the spring migration, but in fall migration they turn up period, periodically. And they don't look like that in the, uh, in the winter, they look like that in the summer. In the winter they look like that. So a huge difference. And So you can go through and look through uh, the overview, this, the info for IDing, uh, life history and maps, and whoa, there we go. So there's its range. So usually the hotter the color, or the warmer the color, it means it's the breeding or summer range. The colder the color, it means it's the winter range. So you can see during migration it usually goes through the Midwest, which has a lot of farms and fields. Uh, we, are, we don't have quite many of those in New England anymore. Uh, but you can see they breed up in the tundra in the Arctic and they winter down into South America. If, uh, do they, I don't know if it's linked to this. If you don't know how to identify a bird, you can browse a bird guide by family or shape. So everybody knows a duck is a duck and a hawk is a hawk, right? So, and you know what those look like. So you can search by family, and it says here, uh, ducks and geese. And then it'll, go, it'll give you all the ducks and geese that you can go through here. 
There's one, yeah. We'll go to the brant. So they come here in the winter. They look very similar to Canada geese, except they're white patches on the neck, not in the cheek. And they eat eel grass. And we get a lot of them together, they're very loud. And you usually see them on the beach going along the shoreline in large groups, 20 or more. And there's a video. Let's see if there's just one or if it's a large flock. But they're smaller than a Canada goose. Uh, they sometimes do hang out with Canada geese. Uh, but 90% of the time you're going to see them on the beach and at salt water. You're, very rarely, rarely do you see them at lakes and ponds. So allaboutbirds.org, that's a very good uh, site for re reference and uh, for finding out about birds. Uh, so then we can click on the hyperlinks here, it says what does it eat? It brings you to what it eats and where it nests. Um, how long it incubates the eggs. And so that's a really neat tool that you can use. Um, another one is eBird. So historically what birders would do is they'd write down all their notes, what they saw, where they saw it, what the weather was like, and keep track of all the, all the species they've seen in notebooks like this. Uh, but then one day when my neighbor passed away and I found uh, a date where he went birding in Texas on my birthday back in the early 90s, that data is just on a piece of paper at the, en at the end of the day. Uh, now what we do is there, uh, you enter it online through eBird and that data gets used by scientists at Cornell to then figure out population density, population dynamics, uh, where birds are seen, where they aren't seen, what times of year. And now with the smartphones, uh, th there's an app. So it'll keep track of your checklist for you through the phone and it links to the website and it'll tell you whether or not you've uh, seen a bird. Uh, and put in So now for snowy owl, if I scroll, do scroll down now that I've logged in, it says I've had five observations, which I have five checklists where I've submitted that stating that I've seen a snowy owl. Um, and there are times that I've seen one where I haven't submitted a checklist. So I've seen more than five, uh, but on record I have five and one with photos. So I can click on it and there's the photos of the snowy owl I saw, actually had four that day, um, at Sandy Neck Lighthouse out at the end of the beach. And they like that, those barrier beaches. Um, so this date, that data, these photos are available to, uh, to Cornell uh, for identification purposes if it's rare um, and for other scientific research. And the, uh, again, it'll, it'll also show you, you can play calls through this. Here's what a snowy owl sounds like. Yeah, it sounds more like a bark. But. You get, it, it's not like a lot of people are going out and getting recordings of snowy owls to enter into the database. You can see that was 2006. This, what, this other one is from 1969. But with other birds, to boreal chickadee. So this is another interesting bird, but you can see with their recordings, so that's 1963, 2007. So as 
all this great media uh, for learning about birds. Uh, if you want to try to listen to them, uh, these spectrograms are really nice in that you can visualize the call and the sounds it makes. And you can see, I don't have, I haven't seen one, uh, but there are 3,240 photos that other people have taken and added to the database. And you see, they do come to the to the hand, a little bit of coaxing. Uh, but these are boreal species, so they like higher elevation. It's rare for them to get into Massachusetts, and it's more likely for them to get into Berkshire County and uh, to Central Mass, where there are some mountains. And then if you ever want to... Now, this is for learning about... So if you wanted more information on a northern cardinal, you can do this kind of stuff. Or you can click Surprise Me. Oh, nice, American Avocet, a North American bird. So this is a shorebird, and uh, they have been seen here on Cape Cod uh, in fall migration or spring migration. And, and one of the features when it comes to that general impression, shape, and size, you know, you recognize a hawk, you recognize a duck, you, you recognize a shorebird. Then you go into the beak. How long is it? What shape is it? Well, this Avocet has an upturned bill for feeding like this. And let's see if there's a video. There's got to be a video. No, maybe not. Um, they'll actually walk around. Ah, there we go. So they'll walk around and then skim their bill just under the water with that curve at curved end. So the shape of the bill determines what type of food they can eat. So you got cross bills, which is a type of finch, where the, the bill overlaps and crosses. And it's easier to pick the seed, uh, pine seeds, out of conifer trees. Right, this doesn't seem, want to seem to load. Um, and then you get like the oyster catcher, which uses its big, th large, thick beak for breaking into oyster shells and, for, and clams uh, to eat. going to try surprise me one more time. Let's see if it shows us an Asian bird. Spot-breasted wren. I'm not familiar with that one. And the range map. Ah, oh, Mexico. So you can really learn a lot just by playing around with this uh, once in a while. Uh, or even just simply buying a field guide, opening it up to a random page, and picking one of the birds to read about. And that's how you're going to learn your birds. It's it's not uh, just asking someone all the time or going, you have to go out and you have to look at the books. Uh, they also now have what they call a, a Merlin app, which you can put on your phone. And basically it's a filter. And it asks you everything I would ask you if you asked me what you saw. So how do I know what you saw? How big was it? What habitat was it in? What colors did you see? What was it doing at the time? So this app, you put in those different features, it was bigger than a crow. It had a hooked beak. It had it was black and white and red. Well, then it'll say it was probably a red-shouldered hawk, um, and it helps you narrow down your choices so you're not thumbing through five pages or six pages of hawks. So it is a really neat tool to use. Um, okay, so that's about it for the designed talk. And there are inevitably questions and stories, and, and uh, you see that was quick. Eagles on the Cape. They are on Cape Cod. Um, I have I had one last month, and they are becoming more abundant uh, after the banning of DDT in the 70s. Um, it would get they'd spray it to as an insecticide to keep the insects off of crops. It would get into the water. It would get into the insects in the water. Then it would be, it would bioaccumulate, meaning all the insects that had it, it got eaten by this one fish, would build up in that fish. And then the osprey and the eagle that would eat those fish that would build up in their bodies. And what it did was it thinned the eggshells so that when they were incubating the eggs, the weight of the adult on the eggs was enough to crack them. And if you can't replace yourself, the population declines. Uh, so once that was banned, uh, then they started to do better, and they bounced back. And actually, All About Birds might have a better part. 
Um, I don't think we can zoom in on this. So there's a feature here, you click on Explore, Species Maps, and we'll go to January through February of current year. Let me slip the date range and bald eagle. So now I can, oh boy, it's always tough on a laptop here. All right, I'm just going to do it this way. So all those purple marks are an area where bald eagles have been reported to eBird. And click on show points sooner. All right, so blue balloons are older sightings. Red balloons are newer sightings. So I, since I searched January, February, just about everything is going to be a new or a red balloon. If it has a flame in the balloon, it means it's a hot spot where birders go regularly and report sightings. And if we zoom in even farther, you can see there's several sightings on Cape Cod just in the last two months. And let's see, this one, I think that one's mine. Yeah, I had one uh, January 28th at Long Pasture. I also had one January 2nd. Uh, some other birders that are well known in the birding community, they've had them at Long Pasture. So we do see them pretty regularly. MJ, did she get a, yeah, she saw an immature one, so that's her checklist from, uh, from that day. Oh, Nancy got a photo of it, so let's click on her checklist, and, and there she goes. She had, th got three pictures of an adult bald eagle at Long Pasture Sanctuary. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so this is a really great tool if you want to find out where they're being seen recent, most recently or regularly. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, Nauset Beach and other points. The closest one, uh, someone had one at Crane. Uh, Jim, yeah. Uh, he had one at Crane just a couple, last week. So it's, uh, they are around. There are a lot, uh, more of them than you'd think. And we're pretty sure they're nesting on Cape Cod now. We just nobody's confirmed uh, an actual nest with chicks yet. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Yep. Yep. That is. Let's see. Now we'll switch. Here. Search. Probably a Cooper's hawk or a sharpshinned hawk. Oops. Yeah. And they are called excipiters. Excipiters are woodland hawks. So if a red-tailed hawk is a soaring hawk and a red-shouldered hawk is a soaring hawk, uh, then you get a different shape for an excipiter. They've got short rounded wings with a long tail. So what they like to do is they'll fly down a trail and then turn immediately and go through an opening in the trees that they know is there because they'll frequent the same path all the time. And they're relying on ambush. So they'll come whipping around the side of your house and turn towards the feeders, hoping to catch something off the ground that wasn't paying attention. And that's why if you, okay, you want to feed birds, that's fine with me. Don't complain about feeding the hawks because they got to eat too. <laughs> um, but it is a buffet if you leave the feeder there in the same spot all the time and always have seed in it. Uh, if you move the feeder around or don't put seed in it every day and only put it in every, every week or two, then it's less of a chance of feeding that hawk. Um, but it's still, it, it's good practice because you hear that alarm call from the chickadees that the, the hawk is coming, then you'll get to see the hawk. Uh, yeah, they're also very similar to uh, sharpshinned hawks, but you can see they're, they're all the way, all across the country year round, so you, you can see them this time of year. And a uh, juvenile, this is a younger one. So, yeah. Um, and one way to tell them in flight, you can see this. See how the head is a, ahead of the leading edge of the wings? Uh, so a sharpshinned hawk 
which is very similar but smaller, it's the leading edge of its wings is usually forward of the head. Uh, and then there's some other differences like the shape of the tail. So you get a more rounded edge here for the Cooper's Hawk. See that cross? Yeah, they got a, a T here. See that head up a, a front of the leading edge of the wing? Sharpshinned hawks will have a squared off tail where it's a much more straight line. And they don't have, maybe they have it here, no. Sometimes they'll have a comparison photo of the two species. And no, they, they overlap in size. So the, the female Cooper's hawk is pretty large. The male Cooper's hawk is about the size of a female sharpshinned hawk. And then the male sharpshinned hawk is very small. It's not much bigger than a robin uh, in compared in size. Uh, 